The year was 1916, and a young boy named Glenn and his brother Floyd, living in Kansas during the cold winters, they would go to the schoolhouse early to get the stove started so that when all the children for class came, when the teacher came in the little country schoolhouse, the room would be fairly warm. And it was a coal stove. So the, they were taught, Glenn was only seven years old and his brother was several years older. And they were taught how to start the fire. They had to soak these logs in kerosene, place them in the coal stove, and then put the coal on top of that and get it all started. Well, one day, as you can imagine, things didn't go right. Somebody had filled the, gas, or the kerosene container with gasoline. And so from that, you can picture there was an explosion of fire. Actually, Floyd died in that fire. And Glenn had the bottom half of his legs burned so bad. And so he was unconscious. They took him to the hospital, and I believe he spent about seven months there. Some of the things he heard while he was in bed was, he'll never live. But week by week, they saw that maybe he would. Then he heard the doctors talking to his mother saying, he'll never walk again. It might have been better if he hadn't lived because his legs were so burned. One leg was two inches shorter. All the skin was burned off the front. His arches were messed up. Some of the toes were burned off. And so just think about what he went through. And then to hear that they wanted to amputate. It distressed him so much that his mother said no because he just couldn't handle that. And so he laid in bed month after month. His legs were lifeless, no, no feeling, no movement, nothing. But he had a determination to walk. And so after he returned home, after many, many months, and in the springtime his mother would put him in a wheelchair and wheel him outside. And one time she saw he wasn't sitting in his chair, so she ran out there. And what he was doing was he was crawling in the grass, pulling his legs behind him to the picket fence. And what he'd do is pull himself upright on the picket fence, and then picket by picket, he would pull himself along, his legs just dragging behind him. So she let him do this. He did this day after day after day. He said, I'm going to walk. So jumping through the story, he wore a path in the grass. He did it so often. And then finally, he got a little feeling in his legs. And I forgot to mention, his parents would massage his legs for hours every day, the excruciating pain, the scars, all the things he had to deal with. Well, finally, a little bit of life started coming back in his legs. And then he was eventually able to stand a little bit with the aid of crutches, then a little bit, a few halting steps. Eventually, he was able to put aside the crutches and walk a little bit. And finally, he found that he could even hop. There was so much pain in walking on his feet, it hurt so bad, that if he kind of ran and hopped, it, it felt better. So from that time on, people in the community looked at him, and he would be running here and running there, everywhere, running to school, running to the store. He said, I couldn't walk but 10 steps, and I'd take off running, because he was so grateful to be able to do that. When he was in fourth grade, he was in his work clothes, and he came up to the high school team. We're having a competition that day. They were running the race of a mile. They looked at him. They're in their track outfits and their running shoes. And he's got his old canvas shoes on. And he runs that race as a fourth grader and beats all of the high school. And so he had a potential there. And you think about the pain he had to go through every day because even through the years, he still suffered with circulation and all these problems. Let me read a few of the accomplishments that Glenn had. Maybe you recognize this runner, Glenn Cunningham, from back in the 1930s. In college, he set an American record for the mile in four minutes and 11 seconds. In 1932, he was able to go to the Olympics, and he took fourth place in the 1,500 meters. In 1933, he won the James Sullivan Award as the nation's top amateur athlete. Now, consider what this young boy had gone through. They wanted to amputate his legs, and he had to fight all the way. This makes this all the more astounding. In 1934, he set the world record for the mile in four minutes, six seconds, and that stood for three years. In 1936, he went to the Olympics again, and he gained a silver medal in the 1,500 meters. That same year, he also set the world record in the 800 meters. And in 1938, he set the world record in the indoor mile of four minutes and four seconds. And then towards the end of his life, Madison Square Gardens 
named him the, great, the greatest track performer in their history. Of 31 races through the years, he won 21 of them and was able to have set six world records. So you think about this young man and what he went through. Let me mention also his favorite Bible verse, Isaiah 40, verse 31. It says, but those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And so you think of the determination of this young lad and what he went through to be able to accomplish that. Let's begin by turning to Psalm 27 today. Psalm 27, verse 13. As Christians, do we have the courage to push forward no matter what? To have the determination like Glenn Cunningham did? No matter what the obstacle, are we willing to do that? Let's notice what David says here in Psalm 27. And we'll look at verse, verses 13 and 14. It says, I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. And so, brethren, you think about it. What David went through his life, what we go through our lives, it's easy to lose heart, isn't it? And yet we see the determination. We see the courage of this man, and we know that God wants us to have courage. As followers of Christ, we need to have that same determination, that same courage to move forward. But as it says here, we need to remember that our strength comes from God. You know, in the world, people may run and accomplish great things, but in our Christian walk, in our Christian run, run the courage truly comes from God through his strength. Turn a few pages forward. We'll look at Psalm 31. And verse 24, it says, be of good courage and he shall strengthen your heart, all you who hope in the Lord. So brethren, one of the things we have to remember is we have to do our part. You know, God will strengthen us, but we can't sit there and do nothing. Our loving father and Jesus Christ, our elder brother, they want us to have the courage to move forward. Our qualities, though, we know are very miniature. If you think about a mustard seed and how small it is and how it grows to be one of the greatest of the herbs so that birds can come and nest in it. In the same way, our courage can be small in life, but God's saying it needs to grow just a lot like that mustard seed. It needs to improve and develop. For a moment, consider the qualities of God. Think about the courage that our Father and Jesus Christ have. And then consider that we're in training and they want us, as their children, to have courage like them, like Glenn Cunningham had. And so, brethren, my title today is, Are You a Person of Courage? Are we willing to fight for what we believe in? I want you to listen closely to the definition of courage. Courage is the ability to face danger, difficulty, uncertainty, or pain without being overcome by fear or being deflected from a chosen course of action. Think about that. That is what God is asking us to have. And so we need to consider that. Now let me mention here, it says overcome by fear. It doesn't mean that we don't have a little fear at times. It's just that we don't let it grow and develop to the point it stops us from going down that path that God has called us to. And so a Christian's course of action we know is to follow God to do it with all of our heart. And nothing should prevent us from walking that way. Once we've been called, our minds have been opened, we move forward with full courage. For instance, let's say you're new in the faith and you have a job that says, requires you to work on the Sabbath day or Friday evening before or after sundown. That's tough. That takes courage, as it says here, the definition to face that difficulty, that uncertainty to go to your boss and say, I believe in the Sabbath day. God says, thou shalt not work. And so when you think about that, that person has to have that courage to go there, not knowing if the boss will work with them and switch their hours. Or maybe when they walk away, they realize they don't have a job anymore. 
And so God is asking us to build this courage through life. And so as we face uncertainties in our Christian walk, do we put aside our fear and move forward? That's what we have to consider. So today I would like to discuss how important it is for each of us to grow in courage. And as we develop that courage, I will also discuss that it leads to another trait that we should follow because God commands us to share it with others. Let's go to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 31. Deuteronomy 31, verse 6. Moses is speaking here, and he's telling the children of Israel of how they should be for entering the promised land to take hold of the inheritance that God was giving them. And let's notice what he says here, Deuteronomy 31, and we'll look at verses 6 through 8. Moses says, Be strong and of good courage. Do not fear nor be afraid of them. For the Lord your God, he is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. And I know there's times in our lives when we feel like we're all alone. But here, this is God's promise. We need to remember that. He goes on to say, Then Moses called Joshua and said to him, In the sight of all Israel, Be strong and of good courage, for you must go with this people to the land which the Lord has sworn to their fathers to give them, and you shall cause them to inherit it. And the Lord, he is the one who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Do not fear, nor be dismayed. And so I ask each of us, knowing that God is with us, what are you afraid of? What am I afraid of that would keep us from moving forward? God tells us to fear not. To fear not. The only thing we should fear in life is God. He says, fear God and keep his commandments. But other than that, we shouldn't be afraid of many of the things in our life that we stop at and turn around and go a different course of action. God tells us to trust him, that he'll lead us, that he'll never forsake us. You think about the beauty of that, how important that is. We're not told that we won't have grief. We will. We will have pain. We will have suffering. But God says, have the courage to know that I'm walking beside you and that I will never leave you. In Matthew 28, Christ stated that he is with us to the end of the age. That means for us today that he's still willing to stand beside us and not forsake us. We should trust that God is faithful to help us, to lead us, to grow us into his children. And that's a beautiful thing. Let's go to the book of Joshua, just a few pages forward here. Joshua chapter 1. And verse 6. Joshua 1, verse 6. We'll see that after the death of Moses, that God speaks to Joshua as well. And he's telling him to follow through with the same theme that he told Moses. Verse 6 says, Be strong and of good courage, for to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. And so we see a God that wants us to prosper, and yet he tells us the way to have that. The way to prosperity is to obey his laws and to be courageous and to face the difficulties that do come in life. And so a part of having good courage is to live by every word of God. And that means we have to study it daily. We have to pour over it. We have to think about it and meditate on it. God is encouraging us to put away the fear and have his laws as our course of action. That's what courage is, not being deflected from that. But God says, here's the laws, walk in it. And so this term, be strong and of good courage, is mentioned that I saw nine times here in the Old Testament. You think about how important that is to God. You know, a reason for that is he doesn't want us to forget how important it is to be courageous, to move forward, and to fight this fight. Let's notice verse 9. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed. 
for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Doesn't that bring comfort when you think about the greatest being in all the universe is willing to stand by our side each and every day? And so each member of the body of Christ is in training to grow, to develop, to run. Just like Glenn ran a physical race, we have a spiritual race to run. And God says, I'm running right beside you every single day. Don't ever forget that. Verse 18 of chapter 1. Whoever rebels against your command and does not heed your words in all that you command him shall be put to death. And then he says, only be strong and of good courage. Look at how important that is to God. And so we see that courage is linked to conviction and commitment. God requires these traits in us. They all go together, you know, to be convicted, to be committed, and to have that courage. It's a part of growing in God's way. And so how can a person act courageously in the face of danger? They have to be convicted. They have to know and believe with all of their heart that God is with us and that he will work it out. He will help us. He will forgive us. When you think back to a time when you were baptized and you consider the commitment you made before God. And we knew at that time that we had to count the cost. That If we're going to go forward, if we're going to start this race, we have to consider that there will be tough times along the way. It will be difficult. But when we commit there, we say, God, there's no going back. I can't take my hand off the plow, as it says, and turn back. We have to continue that race. And so, like Glenn, we have to pull ourselves up at that picket fence. And with God's strength, day by day, pull ourselves along until he gets us running in the spiritual race to keep going, to keep fighting. Let me give you a quote by a man named Robert Green Ingersoll. Here's what he says about courage. The greatest test of courage on earth is to bear defeat without losing heart. You think about that. We all have been defeated at times, but we can't lose the courage. We can't lose heart. God says, get back up. Keep going. For Glenn, keep running. Keep trying. Because you think about those races that we won. We can hear that and say, wow, that's great. But we don't realize the amount of pain he had to go through, the years of training and pushing. Because they said he ran awkward with one leg shorter. He had to make up for the, the ease of running. He had to make up for it in strength and endurance. And so he had a difficult race. And so courage is not about how many times we fail, but whether we keep going, whether we keep trying in life. How many times did Glenn Cunningham have to drag himself? Along that fence? How many times do we have to get up to keep fighting this, this life and all the things that come at us? So the definition of courage, you think about it. God says that he wants us to be able to face danger, difficulty, uncertainty without being overcome by fear and not being deflected from a chosen course of action. That is what God is asking us to do. And our course of action should be seeking first the kingdom of God, of really thinking about that and everything we do in life builds on that principle. Seeking that first and seeking his righteousness, which is living by his laws. Let's go back to the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 17. 1 Samuel 17, verse 4. I want you to consider a story of courage that most of us have read, maybe to our children. We've looked at it over the years, and I don't know that we've reached this level of courage, but it's something we should work towards. The background here is the children of Israel, their armies are lined up on one mountain, and they're ready to go to battle. They're set in battle formation. The Philistines are on the other mountainside, and there's a valley in between them. And at this time, David was sent by his father to go check on the welfare of his brothers who were in the army. And so David goes to that camp, and he's delivering some items. He hears some words there. He hears a challenge. And so let's look at verses 4 through 7 here in 1 Samuel 17 and consider what David heard. It says, And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. Can you imagine? He was just under 10 feet tall. I'm about six foot, so four feet taller than I am, 
and you start adding the width of those shoulders and the size of his arms and legs, I, I can't imagine. This guy was huge. Verse 5, he had a bronze helmet on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. The commentary states that was over 150 pounds of just what he was wearing around his chest. For most of us, we would have a tough time just picking that up, let alone wearing it and walking into battle with it. Verse 6, and he had a bronze armor on his legs and a bronze javelin between his shoulders. Now the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels, and a shield bearer went before him. Someone commented that possibly in the commentaries that the spearhead alone weighed 18 pounds. And so you start adding the length of that spear and consider the weight of it, and I doubt any of us could even pick it up and throw it. This man was monstrous. And so you think about that. Let's look at verse 8 now. Then he stood and cried out to the armies of Israel and said to them, Why have you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and you the servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. Now you think about that. A man this size, he's standing there saying to all those men of valor on the other side, those Israelite men, just one of you, come over here, try it. Verse 11, when Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Well, I think most of us would be. You look at the size of the man. And so if you read the ongoing verses, it says that Goliath did this for 40 days. For almost six weeks, he went out there morning and night and spouted these words, taunting Israel, saying, I defy you and, and so forth. And so let's look at verse 26. As David there is in the camp, bringing things to his brother, here's what he says. Then David spoke to the men who stood by him, saying, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Now you can start to feel the courage that David had. I mean, these other men are all standing around day after day, 40 days, hearing this. And he's going, what's going on? I mean, he's defying our God. He's not looking at the size of the giant. He's looking at what he's saying against God. And so we need to consider that. You know, think about that morning as David prayed. He had no idea the courage he would need later that day. Nor do we. As we get on our knees each morning, we do not know what we're going to face that day. And so it's so important to go to God for that strength so that he helps us through every obstacle along the way. King Saul then hears of David's statements and he says, bring them to me. David approaches them and he looks and he goes, you can't go fight Goliath. And then finally David says, well, let me prove to you. And he tells about when he's a shepherd and how he fights against bears and lions. And so let's look here in verse 37. Verse 37 of 1 Samuel 17. Moreover, David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. So the king gave him the ability to go forward. And so David doesn't even have a spear. He tries on the king's armor, and it's so awkward and heavy you know, because David, or Saul, or Saul was a tall man, so that didn't even work. So you know the story. He has a sling. He takes out five stones. And it says here in the ensuing chat verses that he was just a youth. I picture him like 17, 18, 19 years old. Just a young boy. Nothing great in size. And yet he sees here that this giant is making fun of his God. And so let's notice verse 44 now. Same chapter, verse 44. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. 
Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin? But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. So you can see where David's strength was. He was trusting in God. Verse 46, This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. So look at the courage he had, because he trusted in God. Verse 47, Then all the assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. And so you think of the courage of this young man, as he stood there, as he approaches this valley to meet this giant, that it would take to go up to this, the size of this giant and his power and strength. And so you know the rest of the story. You know, he sl slings a stone at him and it beds in his forehead. He falls down. David kills him, cuts off his head. The Philistines run away. And it's so easy to overlook the courage that it would take to stand there. If you and I put ourselves in that place, how many of us would have even been willing to go out there and do that? Even though we go, well, he's talking against God, but somebody else go. You know, that's how it is in life a lot of times. Doesn't God expect each one of us to have the courage that David had, the same courage in our life? I would say yes. That's what God is asking of us. And so we have to be willing to stand up for anything that opposes God. Anything. That's what God is telling us. Let's go back to the book of First Chronicles chapter 28. First Chronicles chapter 28, verse 20. You know, if you think about God put these stories in the Bible for us to read. They're not just for fun. He's saying, I want my children to have this same courage that David had against Goliath. First Chronicles 28, verse 20. We see that years later now, David, he was a man of war. And because of that, he wasn't able to build the temple. God said, your son would build it. And so David hands off the items that he had collected for the temple. He hands the plans to him that had been drawn out for the temple. And he gives that all to him. And let's notice what now David says to his son in verse 20 of 1 Chronicles 28. And David said to his son Solomon, Be strong and of good courage, and do it. Do not fear, nor be dismayed. For the Lord God, my God, will be with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you until you have finished all the work for the service of the house of the Lord. So if we trust God, that he is there beside us, that he is walking with us, lifting us up and helping us, that he won't forsake us, then each of us can have the confidence to move forward in life. And you and I, we know there's different difficulties. What, what you go through and what I go through are a little different, but they're all the same type of thing in that we need God's help to accomplish or to overcome them. I might state that obstacles, the size of them, shouldn't matter. The size of the man, the giant, shouldn't matter. For David, it didn't. He didn't see that size as, what I'm not going to go. And so in our life, what you face shouldn't matter. Remember, God is all-powerful. He's standing by our side. He gives us the strength. So the size of the enemy doesn't matter. How much money we have doesn't matter. None of that. Even our health shouldn't matter. God's saying, be strong and of good courage. All these items that you and I worry about, he's saying, overlook them in the sense that these cannot distract us from moving forward with what God reveals as his plan. And now has become our plan because we've committed to it. We should consider the courage of Esther, the courage of Daniel, the courage of even Rahab. And I could mention many more to think about how they stood up to things that were very difficult. We need to envision that God is right beside us no matter what we're going through. We should apply this to our weakness, to our trial. You know, what in, what in your life is really tough? That you're going, boy, I don't know how I'm going to get through this. The key is, 
God has the strength, and he will not forsake us. We have to believe that with all of our heart. We have to be willing to strengthen ourselves and each other as we face these difficult trials, knowing God will not abandon us. Brethren, as we grow in courage, there is another trait that we should be developing in. The more we trust that God is with us and that we don't have to be fearful living his way, that should lead us to sharing our courage with others. To share what we've gone through and how exciting it is to know that God is with us. And so for the remainder of my time, I want to talk about another word that has courage in it, encouragement. We need to share it. Let me give you the definition of encourage. It means to give support, confidence, or hope to someone. That's what it is. And how much do we do that? How much do you and I encourage others? We see here then encouragement is to strengthen those around us, to lift them up. And that's what God is asking us to do. Just as he lifts us up, he's saying, my children, learn the same quality and go out and do it to others. Just like the story of David. Isn't that a story of encouragement? That's what God is telling us as children. Here's a story so that I can lift you up. I can build your confidence. And so as we think about the many words of Christ, they offer us hope. Let me read a couple of them. Statements like, he who has begun a good work in you will complete it. Isn't that encouraging? How about, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That is truly encouraging. I'll read one more. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. You see how much God is encouraging us? And he simply wants us as his children to pass that on to others. Let's go back to the New Testament, to Titus chapter 1. Titus 1 and verse 1. We need to really strive to follow the example of Jesus Christ and to motivate others to continue to do a good job. It's so important. Let's notice what Paul writes to Titus here. Titus 1, verse 1. Paul, a bondservant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledgement of the truth which accords with godliness. Now let's focus on verse 2. In hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. Here's another statement that is so encouraging that God has promised us that we can have eternal life if we follow his guidelines. If we allow his strength to work in us. This is what God is asking us to do. This is the big picture of why we're here. To join the family of God and become his sons and daughters. You talk about stirring up someone. Isn't that what God is doing for each of us as his children? He's encouraging us through these promises, through the stories that he's written out and inspired for us. Let me give you some of the synonyms for encourage. It means uplift, inspire, cheer, motivate, spur on, stir, fire up, stimulate, embolden, fortify. And the list goes on. Those are just some of them. And this is what God is asking us to do to others. If you think about it, he's simply asking us to love our brother, to lift them up, to build up those around us. And so this is how we share our excitement, knowing God is with us, because he's walking beside us. And so we strive to inspire and encourage one another. I might add there's only one way in which we're separated from God. He says he's beside us. He will not forsake us. So the only way is for us to walk away. He will never forsake us or abandon us. And so we have to be careful that we don't get discouraged and drift away from God. Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians 1 verse 3. And so as we're encouraged by God, brethren, how well do you pass that on to others? It's so important. Let's notice what Paul writes here, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3. 
Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. Verse 4, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in, in, in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Do we grasp what he's telling us here? That he is willing to help us to comfort others just as he has comforted us. And you talk about encouraging. You talk about uplifting. Is that God saying, I'm right there through every trial, every difficulty you have. And so each of us has a choice, you know, to stay and stand by God and allow him to comfort us. And so I ask, do we share our courage? Do we share our encouragement with others today? Have you encouraged anyone this past week? Have you lifted someone up? This is what God is asking us to do as Christians. And so I want to talk about just two ways that we can motivate people. The first one is by our words. Our words are so important. You think about the tongue and the power that it has. We can motivate someone with our tongue so quickly. We can cheer them up. But on the other hand, we can tear someone down and disappoint them or discourage them just as fast. And so let's go back to Proverbs chapter 12. And we'll look at some of the statements here. Proverbs 12, verse 18. Some of the statements about the tongue and how powerful it is and how God wants us to use our tongue. We must be careful how we choose our words. And you think about it. With God's Spirit leading us, it's critical that we stop and think before we speak because we can say something we wish we hadn't. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 18. It says, There is one who speaks like the piercings of a sword, but the tongue of the wise promotes health. Have you considered that? Do your words, does your tongue promote health to other people? James tells us the power of the tongue. He says, you know, it's like, it's like a fire set in the midst of a forest. It, it, it can quickly set everything on fire. And so we have to ask God for what to say and then to share that excitement with others as he inspires in that. Let's look at another proverb here, Proverbs chapter 25 and verse 11. Proverbs 25, verse 11. Most of you recognize this one. It says, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver. And so God inspired these words for each one of us to consider as we talk, as we share our life with others, as we communicate with our children, whoever it is. He's saying, your words need to be positive. They need to be uplifting and encouraging. Let's go back and look at an example now of how God is a great encourager. Let's go back to Judges chapter 6. Judges chapter 6 and verse 11. We know that Jesus Christ was a perfect example in everything, so it makes sense that he left us this story about how he encouraged a man. The background here is that the Midianites had come into the land of Israel, and they were killing the, the animals, destroying the crops, because Israel hadn't been following God, so God allows this. And so now let's notice here what is inspired to be said to Gideon. Judges chapter 6, verse 11. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth tree, which was in Ophrah, which belonged to Joas, the Ebezerite, while his son Gideon threshed wheat in the winepress, in order to hide it from the Midianites. So you already see that he was hiding the grain and maybe possibly hiding himself from these enemy that would come in and take things. And so you can see he didn't have a whole lot of courage, but notice verse 12, and the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, the Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. I mean, he's hiding away, and this is what the angel of the Lord tells him. You think about how that would kind of shock you. Verse 13, Gideon said to him, O oh my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? 
And where are all his miracles which our fathers told us about, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Then the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? So he said to them, O my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least of my father's house. Verse 16, And the Lord said to him, Surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. And so we know the story of Gideon. But I just wanted to focus here. Look at how God encourages us. This is just one incident. And so he's asking us, as his children, to go out and do that to others. God calls Gideon a valiant warrior. And so with that, Gideon went out. And with that encouragement, and with God's strength, of course, he was able to go out and subdue the enemy. And they had peace for 40 years. Look at what can be accomplished when we have that courage and the encouragement is a part of it. Do your words inspire your mate? You know, we can say, are you wearing that today? <laughs> or, or we can say, that looks really nice on you. You know, I mean, our words are very powerful. How about when your kids come home from school and they've had a rough day, they had a test, they didn't do too good, and you say, how did it go? And they go, not too good. And you can say, Oh, I could have told you that, you dummy, or whatever it might be said. So we could say, well, that's okay. We'll do better next time. I'll help you. You know, so the words, our tongue is so critical. We need to use our words to stir people to do better, to say, I know you can do it, just like God was doing with Gideon here. We have to give confidence. We have to give hope to the person. Let's look at a second way that we can also inspire through our actions. You know, when you're sitting in a group, let's say late at night, and you're talking, and a person over here yawns. You know what I'm saying. That person yawns, and you sit there and you go, wow, I feel like I'm going to yawn. And you start to clench your jaw, say, I'm not going to yawn. I don't want to act bored or whatever it is. You know how that's contagious? Haven't you all yawned when somebody else yawned? Well, what I'm saying is encouragement it needs to spread just like a yawn. We need to let it go out there and spread among the people. Let me tell you another short story here. There was a soccer player many years ago. It was a young man, 19 years old. He loved soccer. He played it and was pretty good at it. But one night he was driving home and he had a car accident. And the outcome of that is he was paralyzed from the chest down. And so you think about that. I think he was in bed for a couple of years, and, or a year and a half anyway. And while he was there, you think about what's going through your mind as a young man, the rest of your life, laying there just with the use of your hands. And what a change of life that would be. But what made a difference in his life was one of the nurses came up and gave him a guitar and handed it to him. And she had two reasons for it. One was to kind of get his mind off all the things that have happened, and to be less discouraged. So she was encouraging him in that way. But she also wanted him to use the dexterity of his, his hands and fingers. He still had his arms to move, and so he played, and he found that he had a talent in that area. And he continued to play and continued to develop it. Well, speeding ahead a little bit, a couple of years later, tingling started coming into his toes. He started having movement, and eventually he was able to walk again. And so this man because of that, went into the music industry. He began to sing and play and, and so forth. And you know who this man is, most of you. His name is Julio Iglesias. He had that in his life to set him back, and yet the action of a nurse encouraged him to change his whole life. He ended up releasing 80 albums in 14 different languages. He sold over 300 million records all because of an encouraging act that somebody did. So we have no idea what our actions can do for someone. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew 5, verse 14. We'll see here how important it is that our actions 
are to be proper, as God tells us. You know, the nurse did not realize that her actions would change this man's life. And many times we won't know either, but if the same goes for us, that we need to still do encouraging things for people, besides our words, we need to have those actions. Matthew 5, 14. These are the words of Christ. Notice what he says. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So, brethren, think about that. Are you a light that is set on a hill? Are you letting your light shine? Are you encouraging others and lifting them up? That is what we need to be doing. You know, if we stop and think a moment, Satan is our enemy, right? And he's out to turn us away from God, to lose out on salvation, to discourage us. That's his, one of his greatest tools anyway. And so we have to be careful to fight that. Discouragement is the opposite of encouragement. So we have to think about that God's tool is encouragement. Are we using his tool and not Satan's? We have to be careful of the message that we send through our actions. You know, our, even our body language. What are we saying when we talk to somebody? Like, I'm not interested. I'm looking over here while you're talking to me. Whatever it is, we have to be encouraging by the way we act. We need to inspire others by giving them our time, our attention. It's so important. You have to let people know that you are there for them. Just like a card, those get well cards, they mean a lot to those people. In fact, the youth here, a couple of weeks ago, made cards for Mike and Fabiola Angle. And I had the opportunity to deliver a few of those cards to each of them. And you would have to see their eyes to understand what I saw, but just the cards from these little three, four, five-year-olds, their little funny pictures, their spelling, one of them said, Get, get well, G-I-T, instead of get well. But it was so cute, their little drawings. And I just saw it bring warmth and, and a smile to their face. And it encouraged them because the little ones did something for them. And so each of our actions like that are so important. We need to visit people in the hospital. We need to call them. We need to look for ways to, to lift them up. Let's go back to Acts chapter 4. Acts 4 and verse 32. We'll see here an example of a man that was a good encourager. Acts 4, verse 32. Now the multitudes of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. Let's go down to verse 34. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked, for all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold. And they laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed to each as anyone had need. And Joseph, who was also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it, and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. And so you think about his example. Here Paul sends Timothy to inspire the brethren. And we'll read verses 1 through 3 to start with. Therefore, when we could no longer endure it, we thought it good to be left in Athens alone. And we sent Timothy, our brother and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, to establish you and to encourage you concerning your faith, that no one should be shaken by these afflictions, for you yourselves know that we are appointed to this. So you think about how even God's showing us that the apostles are sending people to the congregations to encourage them and lift them up. Verse 6 says, But now that Timothy has come to us from you and brought us good news of your faith and love, and that you always have good remembrance of us, greatly desiring to see us as we also to see you. And so here's a good report that came back after they encouraged. Let's also read verses 12 through 13. 
It says, And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all, just as we do to you, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. And so, brethren, you think about how encouraging those words are. And that's what God continues to do for us as we study His words. Look at verse 1 of the next chapter, chapter 4, verse 1. Finally then, brethren, we urge and exhort you. And the word there, exhort, in many translations say encourage. We urge and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more, just as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God. And so as Christ and then Paul and all the prophets and apostles, they, we see that they encourage us. The examples are there and we must do the same to others. Let's look at one final scripture. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 13. Hebrews 3, verse 13. Breaking into the thought here, it says, but exhort, or in other words, encourage. Encourage one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. So here we have the command to encourage one another. And so we have to ask ourselves, how are we doing? I think all of us can improve in it. We have to examine ourselves, look at how we're doing, and to improve in it. And so in conclusion, I ask once again, are you a person of courage? Are we willing to put aside our fears and our difficulties and face whatever obstacles that God sets before us because we know that God is right beside us, that He will not forsake us, He will not abandon us. We know that Jesus Christ has courage. We look at His life. Look at the trials He faced and how He stood up to them. And so at His return, you think about those He resurrects. What is He going to look for? Well, the exact statements we read in the Old Testament. Be strong and of good courage. He wants that quality in each of those that are going to become a part of the bride of Christ. He's wanting us to develop that. And so we need to choose to practice this quality each day. Today is an opportunity to encourage someone, to lift up your brethren or someone in your family, even your neighbors. Does your family, do your friends consider you to be a Barnabas, a person of encouragement? Brethren, we need to step out of our comfort zone. We need to be like David. And I didn't mention it in that story, but when he started towards Goliath, he just didn't saunter up there. It says he started running. He ran towards his enemy. You talk about courage. What is courage? It's the ability to face danger, difficulty, uncertainty, or pain without being overcome by fear or deflected from a chosen course of action. We've all chosen to follow God. And so we cannot let our fears overwhelm us. As Christian soldiers, our strength comes from God. We need to put our trust in Him. As our, if you ask your Heavenly Father, if we ask our elder brother to help us to develop this quality, this wonderful quality that they both have of courage, let me read a scripture here that they have for us that encourages us. It says, I will be a father to you. And you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Look at how encouraging that is. And so as we go out and we improve in our courage, it doesn't stop there, does it? We have to consider the words that God uses to lift us up, and then we have to go out and share that with others. So let's strive to give support, as the definition of encourage is. To give support, to give confidence, to give hope to others. And then as we develop that with God's strength with trusting in Him, we can go and share that with the rest of the world.